The continent has been trying to get off its knees since after the lockdown. Recall it was a moment uh, for pretty much of the African you know, countries uh, in terms of boosting its economy until COVID hit just a year ago. But this is the conversation we're having today on The Square, seeing how much of, a, of an effort a lot of African countries, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Uganda, are all making to get the economy running. Welcome to VSA. I'm Sliver. You know, Africa's economy has seen its worst in half a century and the difficulties many hope will be banished to memory soon will then actually come up uh, quickly. This will take some time, however, as many African countries still grapple with the hard biting effects of COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic raged on. African nations counted their losses in humans, monetary, as well as developmental terms. High-flying nations like Rwanda, Benin Republic, Kenya, Mauritius, we are pegged back and dipped in indebtedness as their populace needed to be helped for survival. Africa also faced its first recession in 25 years as uh, there was uh, a decline in the gross domestic product GDP for 41 in 54 countries. Oil-dependent economies like Nigeria started, non-oil economies winced and the losses went round. There was a decline in productivity, capital utilization, losses were recorded in health and education proceeds as nations went on lockdown. Now economies are open and ease is seeping through gradually, but the continent is projected to recover in 2021 by growing its GDP by 3.4%. It suffered a decline of 2.1% in 2020. Tourism is still suffering greatly with COVID-19 still lurking. It employs 24.3 million people and that means more job losses and poverty have been recorded as a result. 30 million more Africans were in the poverty line in 2020 and that increase uh, increased rather to 39 million in 2021 and if nothing is done these measures really can't see the continent getting out of uh, this big mess well joining us uh, now on the square is uh, uh dr chiwike uba he's a development economist and public finance management expert well he's the chairman of the board at maka chiwike uba foundation good to have you uh join us uh, on Villa Square this evening. Uh, thank you, Suleiman. It's my pleasure also to join you on this program. Well, the pleasure is always all is mine. Uh, you, you know, looking at the continent and uh, how much of you know an effort every country has put in place. Now, COVID nineteen, uh, well, has been the basic nemesis to uh, the continent's growth in twenty twenty. Do you see governments? responding well enough to helping your nation get out of the big mess they are in at the moment? Um, well, good COVID-19 appeared to be um, a blessing in these guys. Um, we've seen the responses so far from the uh, nations of Africa, from various countries. Uh, having said that, it does appear to me also that the interventions that I've made so far are not enough to jumpstart and, and sustain the, the declining economy of, of Af African economies. The reason being that you cannot solve structural problems using very ad hoc and interventionist approaches. You find out that most of the interventions are not anchored on any sustainable policy framework. And having said that, it's like um, one starting a generator because there is no light without making provisions to get the light back on time. So as soon as the fuel inside the generator gets exhausted, you may go back into absolute darkness. And that is what African countries are, are doing. 
why we commend them so far for the things they've done. It's important that we go to the drawing board to develop a sustainable development plan that will take Africa out of the food world. You know, that's why we're having this conversation, uh, uh, Chiwike, uh, to develop a, a sustainable you know, plan that can actually get the co continent up and running. But the thing here, if you look at the GDP, uh, well, it's been projected to grow by 3.4%. That, that's this year, 2021, uh, on the way to recovery. And that comes with a condition. So if the pandemic recedes, uh, that's just the condition, a singular condition. But it doesn't look like the pandemic is receding at the moment. Yeah, the pandemic is not receding, actually. And uh, let me just say this also. It's important that as we are discussing the effects of uh, COVID-19, that we look at the fundamentals. And um, the projections are about GDP growth. Yes, G GDP growth gives us this uh, sense of hope, the feeling of doing well. But it's important that we look at other macroeconomic uh, fundamentals that are driving Africa's economy. If you look, look at the poverty level, the revenue growth, inflation, education, social se sectors growth and all the rest of it, but you find out that our problem is not just about COVID-19. It's beyond COVID-19. It's just that COVID-19 has brought to fall most of the problems that we are facing. So in answering your questions, if COVID-19 continues with the approach that we have adopted so far, uh, obviously we will exhaust um, what we have. Yes, we, are, we agree that the developed economies may, su may support what we are doing, but it's hitting everybody hard. hard. So therefore, it's important that we begin as people to begin to design our homegrown uh, policies solutions to solve our frictions, the disruptions that has occurred. And we have the, uh, the, the manpower, the human capital to do this, even though most of them are not with us here. But we need that leadership, that leadership capital to do that. So what I'm trying to say here then, if COVID-19 continues, definitely we'll have more problems. It's not just about, I just want to redirect this conversation from the, G, the, G, the, G, the GDP growth. GDP doesn't give food. What gives food is your productivity. And productivity, if you check, let, let me use Nigeria for, for instance. The agricultural growth in Nigeria is largely as a result of the uh, area of land cultivated, not necessarily based on yield. So you might cultivate one acreage of land and why the yield from that land is just less than 40 per, per, percent of the expected yield. And when even when you have gotten that yield, over 60 percent of the yield is also lost as a result of post-harvest losses, as a result of lack of adequate facilities to preserve and to uptake such structures. So we need to be begin to look at these key issues and give less emphasis on GDP growth. Growth that is not inclusive is not the de development. All the key Macroeconomic and microeconomic indicators of Africa is showing that we have not gotten it right. So, so I would want us to look, look at these issues more from the array problems underpinning the development of Africa rather than COVID-19 and GDP growth. Well, anyway, I think uh, listening to you, uh, we, we can glean from, you know, your submission that there are, you know, quite a number of issues that have actually plunged the continent into uh, you know, the situation it is at the moment. But keep in mind, uh, some of these other things away from COVID-19, is it also possible because you try to bring the Nigerian example, let's throw that uh, into, into the, the conversation now. Uh, agriculture, for those countries uh, who are heavily dependent on oil like Nigeria, they tried as much as possible to see how they can diversify. Has that paid off uh, for countries like Nigeria and even Benin Republic? Well, for Nigeria, uh, to, to, to some extent, to reasonable extent, um, the current efforts of the government, not just this current government, is paying off at least. Um, the importation of rice has reduced, even though it has created also the uh, 
some illicit trade and, sm and smuggling of rice. But that has not really solved our problem. As I said earlier on, you can't be talking about using our agriculture as a mainstay, you know, and we are not thinking in the direction of make a, make a mechanized agriculture. Most of our agricultural uh, activities are still um, the usual uh, um, one man and uh, uh, primitive approach to uh, cultivation. Since I started growing up, I've always heard about fertilizer, the MPK. But there are technologies that can be deployed that will tell us the kind of soil that will have the kind of fertilizer that can be applied, the kind of um, uh, um, uh, products that can be grown to also manage uh, the pests and the rest of it all. We are not yet going in that area. If you check the recent Nigeria economic stabilization policy, is still largely dependent on increasing the area cultivated. And for me, that is not in line with the government's policy of diversifying its uh, uh, revenue profile and all the rest of it all. So if we want to go into agriculture as a business, we must begin to introduce technology in agriculture. We must shift our focus from increasing um, the area cultivated to yield and not just yield, but also what happens after the, the crops or whatever that has been have, harvested. I said earlier that over 60% of the yield of agriculture are lost in post-harvest, you know, and that is not sustainable. We recently, we are in the in this season of mangoes and all that. What has happened? Mango is gone, it's gone. Tomatoes during December, January, we have tomatoes everywhere. What are we doing with the quantum of pro to tomatoes we are pro producing? How are we preserving it afterwards? What are the optics, the manufacturing companies that are around to take this thing to the next level? So these are the areas that government needs to begin to look, look, look at. Not just saying we want agriculture, we are moving in agriculture. Where do you want agriculture to take us to? How do we get to that point? What do we require to get to that point? And until we begin to deal with these issues, I've given you examples of the things that we need to do to jumpstart the economy, most especially for, from the agricultural perspective, than the real tricks of saying that we we'll diversify, we we'll diversify, and we we'll give grants that are not targeted. If you give people one million naira as grants for agriculture, what can that do to boost the economy? Why don't you give uh, uh, corporations or People about one billion naira and monitor what they do with that. They use experts to 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 choose select those who can do that and go into re mechanized agriculture that will boost the economy. So there are a, a, a whole lot of gaps that are still existing, and that is something for African some African countries. In fact, for some African countries, they are be, be, better than what we are doing now in terms of action plans and in terms of implementation. You know, uh, talking about agriculture, I, I really want to stay on agriculture for a bit before we expand it further, uh, Chiwike. The, the theme here is, uh, for instance, in Nigeria, we've had this conversation here on the square before uh, where we brought in some other experts from across the continent to look at some of the impediments, uh, uh, you know, against uh, developing the agricultural sector. For instance, uh, low-cost invasion in some African countries and, of course, insecurity uh, in some other places like Nigeria. Uh, you spoke uh, you know, lucidly about having mechanized agriculture in place, but the small time farmer is being you know, stopped from contributing his quota because he can't you know, go to his farm anymore because he's unsafe. Yeah, very Correct. There are a lot of other factors that are militating against agriculture in Nigeria and Africa in general. As you rightly uh, uh, I stated earlier on, insecurity is one key factor that is inhibiting agricultural growth in Nigeria as, as of now. Most farmers are afraid to go to their farms to do anything. And even those that have planted crops, such crops are usually destroyed by uh, the cows and other things 
Uh, people, as we're reading in the news every day, people are afraid. They go to farms, they are, women are raped, people are killed. So even the late show that we are doing is becoming a problem. Um, also, uh, initially, we used to have uh, the forest guards, the uh, uh, extension uh, specialists and all that helps farmers, business support services. Some of those little, little things that used to be in place before, it, despite the insecurity that has over, overflown the country, are no longer there. So these are some of the issues that I believe that as a country, as of the state, as a local government, that we need to begin to, and, and also part of the key problem also is also the, the failure of the local government system, because they are the ones that are closer to these people who the subsistence farmers. The local government system has also failed, so it becomes imperative, increasingly impossible to even interact with the more older farmers to understand what their problems are, and, and also to scale up such problems that attract uh, the necessary support or interventions that will increase you know, the productivity and increase the confidence also in those people. Also, the market for such uh, products are also really not there, we are having this uh, uh, weak financial market. We have also a weak uh, market for some of these products as well. Naturally, if we have done what we need to do, there should be uptakers. We are in these small farm holders, when they produce, will take up whatever they have produced, pay them, and take it to the next value uh, chain and link to the productive uh, sector and all that. So, these are some of the things that are still lacking. And, and, and this is why I say that it's not enough to say that you want to diversify mm -hmm. and move into agriculture when the fundamentals, when the enablers, the drivers of that agriculture has not been put, 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 put there in place. So, so it's not just about uh, mechanization, but for even the smaller ones that we are having, the right environment has not been provided to uh, sustain what is ha happening in, in in the in, 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 in the agri space. Yeah, no doubt some eye opening moment here with uh, you, Chiwike, looking at the issue of security, uh, talking about uh, the issue of uh, you know taking it from uh, subsistence farming to mechanized farming, uh, also trying to look at how most of these countries can also help uh, with education the farmers. But again, if you look at it, uh, uh, Chiwike, for, for most African countries. Their economies are export dependent, especially uh, taking such uh, goods uh, or produce to the United States, uh, China, and even to uh, EU. What are the potential benefits of the African continent and free trade agreement to the development of the continent? Um, Africa continental trade agreement definitely, uh, like I said, will enable um the input from the constituent countries you know to trade among themselves to leverage uh, available labor you know to produce and all that but one key problem that we are still having about in respect to exports is the quality of our products the quality of our pro products you know we don't have this quality assurance mechanism that ensures that what we are exporting meets the expected international quality let me give you a example. I'm, li I'm, I'm living in Nigeria, so I'll be using Nigeria as a case study in most of my analysis. Go ahead. Um, in Nigeria, you still see people selling meat in the open space with flies and all that moving around. Uh, vegetables are still sold on the road with all the exhaust pipes and all the rest of it all. The tomatoes that I'm seeing now are still sold in the open place and all that. So you cannot export such products. You know, the exhaust pipe, the smoke from the exhaust pipe is very, very uh, um, 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 killing. I don't know the right word to use there now. But it's not good to human health. And we said this thing on the road, and people are seeing it. Now, tell me, when you export such products from Africa to the developed country or developing country, Definitely by the time they subject them, if they will do that, if they wouldn't just throw them into the bin immediately. But they find out that if they subject our products to test quality assurance, it will meet the requirements. So we have not 
sat back to say, what do we need to do to make our products exportable? Our, our raw materials, some of our raw materials, which is also a disconnect in what we need to do, are produced and exported and imported back by us in various forms. Our chocolates, we have cocoa in Africa. But our cocos, we don't have chocolate industries in Africa. The cocos are harvested and exported abroad, and we import uh, chocolates at a very high price. So the little money we, we, may, we would have made by exporting cocoa, we spend more on importing chocolates. The same problem Nigeria is currently facing in oil. We export crude and will import refined product at a very high rate, given, and which also depletes our foreign reserves. And it's not just the case for Nigeria and Ghana and all the rest of it. It's something for Africa. In Zambia, where we have, uh, uh, um, um, what do you call it, copper and all the rest of it. People is the foreigners that are exporting and sending abroad to use it to build the cars and all that that we also import here. So what I'm trying to say, for Africa, whereas we have the natural resources and all that to make boost our exports, we should be thinking not just about exporting the raw material, but also exporting finished products, because that's where the real money is. That is where the real earning lies. That is where the foreign, we can earn better foreign exchange. So if we have not de developed our markets, our institutions, in such a way that it will enable us not just to produce, first of all, I mentioned the, the, the issue of quality assurance, the quality of our products. But beyond that, why should we just be an input country where we export raw materials every time without having necessary infrastructure and industrial revolution that will enable us to turn those raw materials into finished products for exports? You see the, the problem. And that is why we are so dependent always, where we, our economy keep uh, um, declining where our foreign reserve keep declaring, where our currency keeps suffering because of, of trade imbalances that arise from our in, 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 inability to do the right things. And let, me, right. let me jump in here, uh, uh, Dr. Chirike Uba. I think you've opened a, a wide vista of, you know, to explore here, the, you know, to stretch this conversation. Uh, the cocoa example uh, and the chocolate and the derivatives that... Uh, uh, come from, you know, producing the chocolate that ultimately doesn't get back to Africa. And of course, uh, the same uh, as uh, your country, Nigeria, uh, taking sometimes crude out and the derivatives out of crude never makes it, you know, or never make it back to the continent, to the country. Now, looking at all of this, uh, you know, human capital development is also lost once uh, these are actually taken out of the continent. But the thing here is, how can this be reversed? Uh, it, it was the Ghanaian president, uh, Akufuado, who also spoke about the chocolate cocoa, you know, uh, dilemma for the continent. But who is to blame here when, you know, the farmers uh, successfully export uh, cocoa uh, to Europe or to the UK, and uh, this is made into chocolate or cocoa drink? Uh, why hasn't the continent uh, also looked in the area of using some of these raw materials at their disposal to better the continent? I will, I will address the issue using uh, uh, three key points. Hmm. The first one is leadership, weakness in leadership capital. Um, we are, have leaders that are not uh, futuristic thinking. We have leaders that are more interested in what they, that goes into their pockets in the short term and their families and all the rest of it. We have leaders that are not really prepared for the offices they occupy. For instance, in Nigeria, so you find out that most of our leaders are those that we are forced, either forced or coerced into contesting elections and the rest of that. And they come without any plan for the country, so to say. So we have leaders that are more interested in becoming leaders, but not with the capital that is required to do the right work. 
Second resource is the uh, which also discourages to itself to the leadership weakness in leadership capital. The education system in Africa uh, uh, over the years has been fallen irretrievably. Where we now devote more time uh, in um, um, sending people to school to acquire certificates without any linkage to the industry. So in that case, uh, the, the the real thing that education is supposed to do is not happening. The third thing is that we're not converting the human resources that we have into human capital. You know, we have a lot of, our population is enough to help us to do most of the things we are doing, but we are not doing that because the education system is not uh, doing what it's supposed to do as a result of the weakness, not just in infrastructure, but also in weakness in learning, in weakness in the environment, weakness in um, um, what we want to achieve with the education uh, and all that. So you find that, that even those who we have that should do that are leaving the continent to other developed countries. Uh, the last but not the least, why we have not been able to do that also is because we don't have plans, we don't have development plans. Africa is such a country that works on ad hocism. And I said earlier on that we cannot solve structural problems using interventionist approaches. Africa is good with interventions, interventions. That is why in Nigeria today, you seen CPBN also muzzling the, the Federal Minister of Finance and other, beginning to do the core functions of the Minister of Finance in fiscal space by doling out money every day to people in support of various uh, um, um, interventions of government to jumpstart the economy. And such things are not really planned. It has no long-term plans to ensure where do we want to go to, where, where how do we get to that point, and have a, a measurable matrix to ensure to, to track what is happening. So we'll bring that money, that is happening all over Africa. We'll throw it into something because we feel that is what is needed. We start doing the necessary research, we start having development plans, successful development plans, both medium to long-term development plans that each government comes in and queues in. So due to the interventionist approach that we have been using, even when a plan is on ground, if a new leader comes because he wants to grab as much as he can, and also to show showmanship structure, such long-term plans are abandoned at will if it's available, when it's available, so we keep running in circles, you know, motion without movement. So these three key problems are the things that has hindered or inhibiting the African countries from um, turning their raw materials into final products for exports. And as long as, as I said, if we are unable to do these things, and also one of the things that are happening is also the claim holders, which are the citizens, are also very dominant. Yes, they may have been dehumanized by the various policies of government, and some of them, most of them are very hungry. So all they care is to just have food to eat. But as human beings, God has given us that same um, 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 power and intelligence to do certain things. So the claim holders also are not pushing to have the kind of government that they want. Remember, democracy is the government of the people for the people by the people. So evidently, the led are not yet uh, yeah. are, 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 are inclined to also pushing their leaders to do the kinds of things that they want to happen in the continent. So it's like everybody garbage in, garbage out. So these three key factors are the things that are affecting us from doing what we need to do. And until we begin to address the key issues, you know, we'll still have this, this kind of problem going forward. We'll see when we come back uh, uh, how much of it we can actually pick off the plate uh, and uh, see how we can address some of them. Uh, you've already highlighted a bit of them, leadership recruitment process, uh, uh, you know, how African leaders emerge, uh, the absence of uh, grassroots governance uh, uh, in Nigeria called local government administration, and a couple of other things, education, you also picked uh, there. We'll see how best uh, we can speak to these, uh, you know, uh, key uh, points and uh, how the continent can reverse it and get working. That's when we return. Join us again.
homeward bound here on the square as COVID-19 gradually faces its final days with vaccines now going round on the continent. Recoveries should begin in earnest. Nigeria and South Africa have led the pack, recording good signs of better things to come. Oil-dependent economies are gradually on their way up and resource-intensive sectors are also better placed. But tourism, which many African nations depend on, still faces hard times and by a consequence, uh, the nations. Now, digital, like digitalization, I was almost going to start on that. It does happen sometimes. Does that happen to you? But anyway, digitalization is key to Africa's development. And as uh, uh, Dr. Chiwike Uba, uh, you know, opined earlier on about, uh, you know, the continent uh, uh, continents need to be properly educated, especially its farmers and its people asking for better leaders. Uh, this is also pretty much key here. You know, uh, the telcos and uh, the fine techs uh, uh, are rising on the continent. African startups in the digital world are now unicorns with Nigerian payment platform Flutterwave becoming the latest on the pile. But if you take this out of the equation, what then happens to uh, the continent uh, e economy? African startups uh, they are also attracting foreign investment opportunities as individuals and groups key into the youthful African population, also as highlighted by Chiwike. For this to rise higher, there is the need for collaboration amongst uh, the countries on the continent, Lagos, Nigeria and Nairobi, Kenya, have become Africa's digital hubs, yet many more can rise. So uh, the continent should go beyond these two countries. Uh, the continent's development leans on education, better training systems, fine tech and diversity. So with reduced foreign direct investment, African ideas are also growing. There are 300 million mobile money accounts in Africa, the highest in the world. And it's a trillion dollar economy. As African nations hope to improve their economy and growth, they must also work swiftly on digitalization. I don't know why I had to put that again a second time. But joining me now uh, is uh, Olufemi uh, Lawson. He's the Executive Director of Center for Public Accountability. Uh, it's just, uh, good to have you join us uh, uh, this conversation. And of course, we still have Dr. Chiwike Uba, who is a development economist and public finance management expert. Uh, uh, let's continue with you, uh, uh, Chiwike. You know, a, a careful look at the best performing sectors last year tells us what the future portends. Uh, for the continent, uh, uh, you know, digitalization is key, uh, even though I, I started on that word. Do you think African governments have realized this, uh, uh, the importance of digitalization? Um, I would say yes. I would say the African countries uh, understand the importance of digitalization in the in the digital economy in fact, mm. because in everything we're doing now is dependent more on technology and it's like recently when this ebm banned uh, the bitcoin the the, 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 the uh, cryptocurrency and all the rest of it uh it's something that will happen what we should be doing is to try to uh work in tandem to begin to put regulations and other to better leverage the emerging um, digital um, infrastructures to boost our economy. So uh, in answering your question, the African countries understand this thing, but there are some other issues that are inhibiting them, which also is uh, more predicated on the factors I raised earlier on. It's not as though they don't know what is good to, to be done, but their primordial uh, and personal selfish interest is not allowing them to open up the system to allow the kind of development that is required. You know, what technology does is that it's, it, it promotes transparency to the level that may be very difficult for those who are doing certain mundane things to continue in that line. So the best approach would be, would be for them is to do everything to stop that. But unfortunately, 
as they think in that direction, they are not just only um, 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 impairing their own uh, um, um, prospects, but also the national and continental uh, prospects and economy. Let me give you an example. You know, we are still stuck with uh, education within the wars. And um, the COVID-19 has shown us that we can't continue in that trajectory. The big question is that what is the African country's dream to leverage technology to ensure that education becomes education without wars? Because if there's any lockdown, what it means that our students both from the pre-primary, primary tertiary will stay indoors or through without education. I know without education, good education, I'm not talking about education to get certificates, which brings me to the issue of curriculum. But the, the, the basic, if we are not digitalizing the education sector, what it means is that our education system might get to a point where African education might get to the point where we can't even do any more things. So it becomes important that we begin to adopt technology in almost all various areas, sectors of the economy to make sure that we are doing that. Then our young people, which African uh, population is largely made up of the youth, and unemployment is so wide among the youth. So the youth are the ones also who are more interested in this technology. They, are, they know how to do it. So the more the African continent refuses to accept technology, adopt technology in the way of doing things, the more insecurity will keep increasing because by stopping technology penetration, what we are doing also is to get these streaming use unemployed. And, and I don't mind they say the devil's workshop. So they begin to do a lot of things. The NSAS issue we saw in Nigeria was because the schools were on strike, COVID-19 kept everybody in dumps. And they were not gainfully engaged because we refused to adopt technology in our education system. So they were idle. So they needed places to, to deploy the energy that is resident in them. And that is what is happening all over Africa. So yeah, just, give me, just, just hold your thought there, too, because uh, uh, apologies button in. Uh, let's quickly bring in uh, 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 Olufemi Lawson, he's uh, yes. uh, he's been having uh, you know a bit of problem connecting, joining us uh, via Zoom. So he's joining us now by phone. Uh, uh, Olufemi Lawson, good to have you join us on the square. Uh, better late than never. Uh, right. you, you know, Chiwika has done quite a, a lot uh, looking at the problems, uh, and uh, now we're moving into solutions, seeing what the continent can do. Uh, to rejig its economy. And, uh, you know, he, he also recognized and identified some of the key problems as insecurity, uh, which has actually hampered some of the farmers on the continent going to the farms, uh, you know, bad governance and uh, leadership recruitment process, people in office, and, of course, the absence of uh, grassroots government, uh, which is also uh, a big problem in Nigeria. Uh, tell us, if you will, uh, quickly, some of the uh, issues you have also been able to identify away from some of these key things uh, 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 mentioned by Chiwike before you joined us. Yeah. Well, fundamentally, we are confronted you know, with these of challenges as a nation, and this has not only impacted on our economic prospects, but it has also impacted you know, on other areas of life that, uh, of course, affect us as citizens, not of just this country any longer, but the continent. I want to pick from where Dr. Chiwike's talk, mm. and it has to do with the fact that how serious are we as a country today in, you know, in, in, in moving along the global reality of, you know, digitalization, and how this you know, can be used to improve the function of our economy. Let me give you an instance. Nigeria as a country today has a ministry of digital economy, that is the Ministry of Communication and Digital Economy. If you look at the functions of that ministry, beyond the regulation of telecoms you know, and other responsibilities that it has occupied itself with, like NIN and others, can there be any tangible intervention now that whole ministry has been able to do, you understand, as far as improving, you know, the, 
digitalization process or the digital economy of the country is concerned? The, the answer is no. It is the same country that created the whole ministry for digital economy that has made every effort to even cripple you know, the instruments for digital economy. When you talk about electronic uh, currencies, digital currencies rather, you know, like the ban placed on the, by the CDN of commercial banks to, you know, to have transactions you know, with, with people who are trading in digital you know, currencies. The government, the policies of government does not encourage this digitalization and our people, especially those that are being saddled with the responsibility of running the institutions that would have promoted our capacity for digitalization are shown to be incompetent in most cases. And this is likely having its impact on our economy because the world is already moving towards that trend and we cannot continue to operate in this analog manner and expect to be economically prosperous as a nation. So this is a fundamental issue. And when you talk about you know, security and every other issues, I want to agree with Chibrike that our leadership equipment process needs to be seriously interrogated. I was watching a national television a few days ago where a member of the House of Representatives made an attempt you know, to submit a petition on behalf of the group, a group of diaspora Nigerians. And you can imagine somebody occupying such an exalted position to preside over the House of Representatives, the Deputy Speaker, saying Nigerians and diaspora do not have right to present petition to the National Assembly because they, they don't live in Nigeria. These are people whose remittances into the country alone is next to oil as far as our revenue generation is concerned. So the people that will recruit to occupy positions in Nigeria, a lot of times, like I said about the inadequacies of our, of our institutions to, to move along the digitalization process, are people who are not just only unqualified. A lot of them lack the basic understanding of the duty of leaders, the responsibility of leadership. And this has impacted negatively on every sphere of our life as, as, as a people. Uh, to uh, Olufemi, I think he, he said all you, you said, you know, before we went on the break, and it, it, it has to do with uh, leadership. And now he's saying, uh, you know, stretching it, going to uh, where you left off, perhaps maybe you can speak pretty much more on that. Uh, the kind of education uh, you were trying to highlight should go beyond the four walls. It should be maybe uh, a kind of education that opens up the mind and uh, makes you see what your people want, what your people need to the extent that you push and you drive same uh, to actualize uh, it for the people. So, so Chiwike, you know, this, this, that's, the, that's the whole essence of this. It means uh, we can conveniently stay on the issue of leadership uh, till we, we close the show today because it's, it's looking quite big and it's disheartening to note that um, leaders on the continent don't think, you know, uh, in line with the people or fixing things that should be fixed pretty fast. Yeah, I agree with you completely. That's what I earlier said. Our leaders are, are more interested on, on the short term. They're not thinking long term. And it's important that as we discuss leadership that we also draw it down to our individual um, um, opinion, our individual personalities. Because when we talk, talk more about leadership from that macro, uh, economic, level we lose the sense that every one of us is a leader in our various spaces the big question is that what do we do in our own individual spaces to 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 promote and protect the economy and the people that are unborn mm. if every one of us uh, are doing what we're supposed to do um obviously the those ones that we refer to as leader well, we'll definitely begin to do right, the right things. It's because that we don't de 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 demand accountability. Because in some way or the other, most people 
are also involved in some of these issues that we have raised uh, earlier today. So it, it calls for a reorientation, it calls for individual people having sober reflection, rethinking on how we, 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 we do things. And um, also, the, you find out that mentoring is something that has almost gone dead in Africa. You know, people don't really understand people. People are not mentored. We do things. We, we, we wake up one day and want to do things that we have not really learned. We, have, we don't have anybody we look, look up to. Now, our value system also has been eroded. Where we look up to those who are riding uh, SUVs and all that without also thinking on how such things were acquired. So there's a whole lot of issues, gamut of issues that are around leadership issues in, 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 in Africa. So we need to begin to think as individuals first, what can we do to make sure that our environment, that people around us are better? We need to have that mindset at the macro. So, so if you yeah. don't mind, let me let me ask let me ask uh, Lufemi uh, to 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 weigh in on that. Uh, let's start quickly. See if we can uh, uh, take some few moments uh, talking about solutions. Uh, Lufemi, uh, uh, you had uh, you had uh, Chiwike. He wants yeah. us to yeah. start. Yes, to start talking about uh, solutions. Uh, the key thing here is uh, the continent. Uh, uh, whether it's leadership or the people, uh, they all must work uh, together to see that the continent is better. Uh, d does it also bother you, uh, uh, Lufemi, that yeah. countries on the continent uh, can be counted amongst donor nations, uh, nations who also would look to other nations outside even the continent and say, we want to help you out, we're giving you certain amount of naira or dollars. So what are those things that the continent can start doing to, you know, change in the narrative? Well, I think uh, there has been a deliberate policy on the part of Afri most African leaders, you know, to perpetually keep the people in a sort of mental bondage. Today, one of the fundamental tools that leadership across Africa has continued to use to, you know, to enslave the people as in education. And that's that actually what they say. You know, when we talk about education, most times people think it's about the Y, the X, and you know, what people get up out of the four walls of the schools. Because leaders in Africa have deliberately you know, reduced the content of education to certification. We just want our children to go to school get certificates and out. The real essence of education is this taking away from our people day in, day out. And when we have a population that is not educated, a population that is not taught history, a population that is not taught civic responsibility, a, a population that is not, you know, versed in its own constitution or how it is governed, you can be rest assured that we continue to produce leaders mostly like we are having in Africa today. A lot of them are there to sit tight. A lot of them want to be like president, like prime ministers, and not a lot of things. But in moving forward, the, 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 the responsibility is now beginning to fall on the citizens. Mm. Just like you cited, you know, in the case of the NSAS movement in Nigeria, the population of the, the younger people must now begin to take it up upon themselves, to sensitize themselves, educate themselves, not the education as in the four walls of the school, about what is needed as a continent for us to move forward. Because it is fundamentally clear that no leader in the best of the countries in Africa today is willing to let go, especially for the next generation of leaders to emerge. We all saw the outcome of the election in Uganda. We all saw, of course, elections across some other countries of Africa. And just like you said, African leaders have turned the continent to a continent of perpetual beggars. We don't contribute to global development. We don't donate to global, even to countries that are poorer than countries of Africa, Haiti and others. You really find African countries coming to make, to, to, to stand in position of donors when they have issues, when they are natural disasters. We have reduced these countries 
still perpetually begging you know, continent. And this narrative has to change. The wealth with the, with the abundant natural resources, with the wealth of you know human resources, I don't think countries in Africa should be perpetual beggars that should wait for donor organizations that should perpetually be the receiving country, rather than you know, being part of the global effort to also uplift others. But All I right. think it is the next generation of leaders that should see this as one of our fundamental you know, you, 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 you know, so, sorry I have to kick in here because uh, we're out of time. You know, there are really many pages in the book of Africa and its economy is just one of them. Uh, we'll open more in the coming days and at this point in time, I'd like to say many thanks uh, for joining us, joint men, especially uh, both of you, uh, uh, Olufemi Lawson and uh, Dr. Chiwike Uba. Uh, I hope to see both of you again on the show. and. Uh, uh, for Chiwike to tell us more about uh, your uh, foundation, that will be some other time. I just hope that uh, you have time to come on the square and tell us about uh, the Amaka Chiwike Uba Foundation. Well, that is a wrap on the show here uh, on VSA. Uh, we keep the conversation going and it's all about the continent for this week. So tomorrow, I'll be here again. See you then.